All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Artful Intelligence <laughs> number one. And uh, we have uh, a number of uh, participants in this program, four participants, uh, all uh, variously uh, uh, called artists. Uh, and uh, I think uh, they represent that little three-letter word art at its, at its best. Uh, Easy to call oneself artist. I think it's one of the greatest compliments when somebody else calls us or calls somebody else an artist. I think it's a grand compliment. Uh, one of the highest callings uh, that humans can have, I think, is to be artful, to be artist, to be creatively motivated uh, with a sense of responsibility. Uh, and I think that's... Uh, uh, represented by those who are on this particular laser. So I don't want to take much time. This is a program. This is the third uh, laser in this series, which runs through next uh, Friday. Uh, so there are a number of, there are altogether 12 lasers, uh, over 30 participants. And if there's a little time at the end of this session, I will talk a bit about the upcoming programs. But right now, um, I'm going to let each of our presenters uh, describe themselves and their work and uh, and inspire you with uh, what they're about to do here. So I think I'd like to start, um, actually, I want to start with Andrea, uh, just because Andrea has been really a, a, a major partner in the realization of this uh, special laser program with SciArt Santa Fe and Laser Santa Fe. And we are Santa Fe neighbors and colleagues, and it's been a real joy over the many years now getting to know Andrea and uh, being involved in projects together. And I'm going to hand it over. Andrea, inspire us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Richard. I knew you were going to put me on the spot as the first one. Okay. <laughs> you can rise to the occasion. I, yeah, I'm just, I'm so thrilled to be a part of this um, incredible um, series. And, uh, you know, in thinking about um, how my work has addressed this um, fascinating topic of the nature of information and reflecting on that, I uh, started thinking about uh, air as it being a real thread in my work. Um, since I really started working and air as a conduit or a, um, a vehicle for information, but also as air as containing information in and of itself um, and creating information. So um, I want to frame this talk um, with this wonderful quote from uh, David Abrams beautiful book becoming animal. Oh yeah where he really talks about um, the, uh, the specificity of atmosphere and air, um, the translucent medium of exchange between the breathing bodies of any locale, subtly different in each terrain. And that's really been something that I've experienced. Um, I, I started um, my art science my real serious art science journey by working with atmospheric scientists and meteorologists. And this project that was done um, around 2000, 2001, uh, sonifying uh, data from a very highly detailed uh, meteorological model of a storm at multiple um, elevations. And so kind of taking that data that represented um, wind speed, temperature, um, a number of different parameters and translating that into sound uh, or, or data sonifications was the first kind of place I was and very geologically based. And my work became even more geologically based in 2007 and 2008 when I went to Antarctica International Science Foundation. Um, artist in residence, I worked alongside amazing scientists like these um, in the dry valleys and recorded uh, not only the soundscape 
um, my sonification is very much inspired by the soundscape, uh, but also sonifications of the data that the scientists were connected, uh, were, were collecting, and then also the um, voices of the scientists, uh, who at that time uh, were federally funded by the US and not able to say the words climate change in their publications. Um, and so that working with them became a conduit for them to speak about the concerns that they had uh, with climate change. And I put out an album uh, called Sonic Antarctica uh, that's on the label, uh, a German label called Groom Recorder. Uh, also put out a book about that work, invited a number of really amazing artists who have engaged with the Arctic and the Antarctic in kind of our modern contemporary era and specifically uh, with digital, um, digital media. So I also work with, um, you know, I had been working with data related to sound. I'm a, I'm a professor of art studio and I'm also an associate professor of computer science. And I've been working very much with the digital data information related to uh, air and atmosphere and uh, meteorology, but I really wanted to work with air as a material. And so I did pieces like this um, piece. This is at a Parco Arte Vivente in, in uh, Turin. It's called Breather. This uh, bouncy expands and contracts over a car over the course of a minute as if it's breathing. I also created this work, Cloud Car, which is a car surrounded by a by a cloud inspired by Dillard Scafidio's uh, Blur Building. Uh, this is at the um, uh, uh, New York Hall of Science. Uh, this is the port uh, a graphic of the portable version that uses tanks of um, compressed water and uh, NOx. And then, um, you know, just to show kind of, I always like to show this, you know, one of my proudest moments as an artist, I had Cloud Car on the street. It attracted the attention of New York's Bravest, the fire uh, company, and uh, they thought it was on fire, uh, but then they realized that it was um, water propulsion, which is the, one of their expertise. So we had a conversation about mist and, and water propulsion, and they put the Cloud Car sticker on their fire truck. <laughs> It's just fantastic. Um, the mist also becomes a platform for telling stories. And um, interestingly, you know, about what has already been mentioned in this conference is the idea of science fiction, telling stories about the future and imagining the future as an artist. And so that was something I was involved in after 9-11 when I was in New York. I was involved in a program project called New York 2050, which is about imagining the future of New York 50 years in the future. There's a few uh, more projects like that, always imagining 50 years far enough away so that amazing things could happen close enough that you can imagine it or it might be uh, in your lifetime. And my contribution to that was looking at the Queensboro Bridge, which was a, a bridge that was kind of part of my life and imagining wind turbines uh, to power the necklace lights of that bridge. So that was really, you know, kind of early on in the 2000s. I, I got engineers, we did a feasibility, we, we proposed a feasibility study, we did budgets and proposed it to the New York Power Company. They said, um, sorry, the three to five year payback that you're talking about is not good enough. We need a two year payback. And I kind of put that project aside and I started looking into what it takes to do a feasibility study, which one thing is using weather stations. So I got five um, uh, semi-professional weather stations, posted them in places around the world, and then started working with scientists who were doing different types of sensing. And so I connected with some uh, atmospheric scientists that were sensing at that time PM 2.5. It had a very new kind of sensor in kind of the early um, 2010s. Um, and I created this work um, called Particle Falls. And this is a visualization in near real time of particulate pollution um, on a site, a very uh, site-specific uh, particulate pollution. And I've had the uh, opportunity to show this uh, all over the world. It's been a really wonderful uh, way to work with organizations that are trying to advocate for clean air. So uh, this is in North Carolina. I also showed it in Paris um, uh, for the COP21, for the climate conference in COP21. Um, and 
that piece, as you saw, is a projection, a light projection. And as a public work, uh, light projection can be challenging because uh, a lot of ambient light, um, uh, sunlight can make it really difficult to see. So I started working with, uh, you know, sort of in the late 2010s uh, with LED lights and the prices were coming way down, the, uh, the number of colors that were possible were incredible. And I did a, a small, well, a, about a 20 foot project at the um, Balloon Museum in Albuquerque uh, for uh, Balloon Fiesta 2014. And then amazingly, I was really, I, I was invited to do a light piece, a uh, public art piece on uh, one of the Three Sisters Bridges in Pittsburgh. And I was able to scale up that 20 foot to over 900 feet on the, um, the 9th Street or the, the Rachel Carson Bridge um, in Pittsburgh in 2016, which was 15 years after the original concept of the Queensboro Bridge. So it was really a wonderful to do that, work with a company to make custom, beautiful custom vertical turbines, uh, work with the city to uh, raise awareness of um, uh, wind energy potential and create uh, wind energy and put back energy into the grid from this project that was up for two years uh, in Pittsburgh and created a series of animations. So the original concept with this piece with, with uh, the Queensboro Bridge was to just light the necklace lights with wind power. But the technology of light had progressed so much that by the time I was able to present uh, this in Pittsburgh, was able to create these really detailed and colorful animations, including this animation, which I call the Rainbow Rain, which is showing uh, changes in density and speed based on the wind speed, uh, based on the wind power potential. Um, so I did a book uh, related to this project and other amazing environmental uh, data projects called Hack the Grid. Uh, with a, a Carnegie Museum of Art. And I was also able to reuse a lot of the technology used on the bridge when it went down in 2018 for a permanent piece, which is in Pittsburgh um, called Garrison Canal, which visualizes, uh, animates uh, weather, um, precipitation and temperature. Um, and then my most recent of kind of the series of light visualizations work called BioBridge, uh, which was completed in 2021, um, done during COVID. Um, I actually was not able to go down. It opened for the Super Bowl um, when it was in Tampa, uh, Florida. This is in Tampa, Florida, between the um, uh, Convention Center and the Marriott. And, um, uh, but this is a, a more interactive uh, piece working called BioBridge that responds to people's movements underneath the bridge and is inspired by bioluminescent bacteria. Uh, so I have um, kind of a practice related to bio art and um, have been doing that for about uh, 10 years now. I had a, a, have had some amazing opportunities to work with, for example, Orrin Katz and Yonat Sur and um, grow and create projects using different types of bacteria, SCOBY, gloves, and things like that. I think you'll see much more developed work in this area of bio art uh, from our, uh, some of our other presenters. Um, but I have been developing some new work now, and um, it's really a different, uh, it, it feels like a different direction. And as I have been thinking about this presentation, I uh, became aware of um, some incredible uh, research that's being done into um, bacteria deep uh, underground, deep in the mines, several miles down beneath the crust uh, of the earth. There's been uh, discoveries of uh, intense and vast um, amounts of uh, microscopic life forms. And because of this, um, Life form, these life forms have created this mineral, the amazing mineral repertoire that exists in the earth that doesn't exist in other planets as far as we know. Uh, this combination of tectonic activity and the ceaseless bubble of life, earth developed a mineral repertoire 
unmatched by any other known planetary body. And I've been taking advantage of this um, by using glass and ceramic and a variety of different minerals to actually f uh, create a, a glass foam and a ceramic foam. So I've been really excited. It's a very different direction for me, but it's been a very uh, deep dive into um, the vast um, resources of minerals that we have in uh, our world and in the region that I'm in, in, in around um, uh, New Mexico. And it's been an, uh, another way to think about how is air, how does air participate with sculpture and with materials and how and is there a way for you to kind of control air so i was controlling air with those car projects breather um but this is a different way where it's almost like um freezing air in a in a moment um so i'll show you a few of those early pieces um after a long kind of research project, I've been successful with this only this year, only the past uh, kind of half year, which has been really exciting. Um, and in addition to this, um, I've been looking at um, form in relation to sound in relationship to air moving. So I've been taking um, spectrograms of sounds. These are some bird sounds that I recorded and I've been mapping them on uh, mapping them onto three-dimensional shapes and animating them. So I'll just play some briefly. So this for me is a real novel um, visualization technique of uh, uh, for visualizing sound. I've also 3D printed those and cast um, the negatives in clay to make uh, bread bowls. This is part of a project called Promosalm that uh, I developed in a residency in um, Cultivamos Cultura in Portugal this past year. And then most recently, I've been working with glass, blown glass into molds of these forms. So uh, the animated forms, then frozen, then 3D printed, and then blown into pieces. And I'll just end, uh, I hope I didn't go too much over with um, one of those animations um, that um, I'm working on for an exhibition that will open in a couple uh, weeks at the UNM uh, Art Museum and um, kind of exploring the idea of the drop or uh, an Edgerton photo of a, of a drop of water, but that drop of water in this case is animating um, sound and um, maybe expressing the life that might be in that. That's it for me, thank you. Thanks so much, Andrea. Uh, and uh, we're gonna just keep moving through the presentations and hopefully have time for some discussion afterwards and a little bit of uh, uh, my uh, letting people know about what's upcoming after this session in the next few days. But uh, right now, um, well, just uh, let's just go over to Ken Rinaldo, the wonderful Ken Rinaldo in Ohio, <laughs> uh, one of the great international locations in the world. There, <laughs> we're becoming more international with JD Vance every day, right? Sadly. Um, anyway, first I'd like to thank uh, Richard Lowenberg and. Uh, uh, also, Andrea Pauli, and for all those others who are involved in organizing this tremendous, uh, tremendous um, week of wonderful presentations. Andrea, amazing work. Thank you. I am Ken Ronaldo. I'm a retired pro professor from the Ohio State University Art and Technology area, now a full-time artist. I'm a maker and an inventor. And my work focuses on hybrid ecologies involving animals, robots, algorithms, plants, and bacteria and using art to explore and amplify the symbiosis within ecosystems. The World Wide Web 
though an extensive network mirrors natural systems like fungi and forests or human nervous systems. However, it remains the largest coal-fired network posing environmental challenges. As technology evolves with self-aware software agents, we see the emergence of an algorithmic species reshaping our relationship with natural living systems. The accessibility of knowledge has really transformed our imaginations and creativity, uh, integrating us in a web of augmented cognition, technology, mimicking evolution, makes us composites as a multi-species being with AI as a new semi-intelligent form. While large language models and AI offer solutions to sustainability, climate change, and most excitedly, trans-species communication, they also contribute to environmental damage representing both our greatest challenges and potential downfall as we and all the other species and environment we rely on face extinction. Autopoiesis explores emergent intelligence through AI-driven musical and robotic sculptures. These soft robots made from Cabernet Sauvignon grapevines interact with the public. Yeah, Autopoiesis explores emergent intelligence through AI-driven musical and robotic sculptures. These soft robots made from Cabernet Sauvignon grapevines interact with the public and adapt their behaviors based on participant presence, making them approachable and friendly. These soft robots representing an early form of artificial life and AI coding, and they exhibit a distributed consciousness. Humans interact with this augmented AI installation acting as activators and symbionts. These robots can act both individually and as a group consciousness. Individual robotic inputs based on interactions feed code and values back to a global controller, which manages the robots when they act as a group. When robots break from the group, they sense and act individually. They communicate using telephone tones, providing emotional feedback to participants in the installation. These works explore the wisdom of distributed intelligence observed in living, conscious grapevines. They raise questions about plant consciousness and the potential for consciousness emerging from simple rule-driven systems. In this work, it is not the matter itself, but the organization of the matter and electronic systems that determines the structure and behavior of the whole. And here's a video showing the works interacting and moving. Right now, they're acting as a group. And you could see they're moving as a group because nobody is interacting with them directly. But uh, they play games with each other. They pass messages. They play a follow the leader game where one will tell the other what to do. Grapevines were a very soft material and intentionally selected because, of course, they're approachable and they're within the realm of biological systems, making them and viewers feel very comfortable interacting and moving amongst them. Here you can see they're diverging and doing different behaviors. At the tips of the robots are sensors that sense you. The robots move toward your body heat, but they stop within inches of your body as you enter the space. Right now, here again, you'll see that they're, they're in a group mode. They're being controlled by a single microcontroller. And as I enter the space, you see they ignore the global controller and may now they pay attention directly to me. This, by the way, was a commission from the Chiasma Museum in Helsinki, Finland. The next work I'd like to show you is called the Augmented Fish Reality Installation, and it features five rolling robotic fishbowls designed to explore interspecies and transspecies communication. These intelligent robotic sculptures house Siamese fighting fish that use robotic hardware to move their fish bowls, showcasing their intelligence and ability to affect their environment. Peace lilies in the water allow the fish to interact without violence, demonstrating the evolution of signs and meanings in a shared environment. The lilies also create a symbiotic home for the fish, providing nesting grounds and oxygen. The fish in turn build, build bubble nests to attract females. 
The lilies thrive by absorbing nutrients from the fish waste, ensuring a healthy environment for both. Genetically manipulated Siamese fighting fish traditionally are bred to fight to the death for human bedding. In Thailand, they call them plakat for tearing flesh. And they engage in, in this work, they engage in nonviolent social interactions in this installation. By moving about, they choose to interact with their environment and other Siamese fighting fish, demonstrating how social interaction in a techno augmented environment can evolve in a shared space. These fish can see clearly beyond their glass balls and control their individual fish cars. While many have recently replicated this project, this original version dates back to 2003. And here is um, the work functioning. Let's make sure, yeah. Augmented fish reality is an interactive installation of five rolling robotic fishbowl sculptures designed to explore interspecies and transspecies communication. These sculptures allow the Siamese fighting fish to use intelligent hardware and software to move their robotic bowls under their control. As with many fish, Siamese fighting fish have eyes which allow them to see for great distances outside the water. Fish have the ability to mentally map their environments in finding food and avoiding predators. This design uses four infrared sensors around each bowl, which allow the fish to move forward and back and turn the bowls. By swimming to the edge of the bowl, the fish activate motorized wheels that move the robots in that direction. By the way, this is maximum speed for the robots. They also had foam wheels, which made it a very comfortable Humans environment with for the them. Work simply by entering the environment. These bowls consist of a living environment of peace lilies, which help to absorb the waste stream from the fish. The bowls and robots are designed to allow the fish to get within one quarter inch of each other for visual communication between the fish, both male and female. Here you could see one male fish looking at the other. When they get close to each other, they flare Small their gills, showing their teeth. Cameras mounted on 45 degree angles under two of the bowls image the interior of the fish bowls as well as humans in this environment and these images are intercepted with video transceivers and projected back to the walls of the installation and give human participants a sense of both looking into the interior of the tanks and feeling as if they are immersed in the fish bowls or taking a selfie in this case um many have questioned whether or not fish are intelligent they certainly are intelligent. Here's an example of goldfish, some of the most intelligent fish. These are goldfish doing synchronized swimming. This is something that I found on the World Wide Web. It's not something that I did directly, but I think it really demonstrates that given food rewards, anything, fish, fleas, insects can be trained. But in this case, fish are far more intelligent than we can stop. The next work I'd like to show you is called The Autotelematic Spider Bots by myself and Matt Howard. It's an artificial life and AI driven swarm robotic installation. It consists of 10 spider like sculptures that interact with the public in real time, self modifying their behaviors based on interactions with the viewers, each other, their environment, and their food source. These robots were experiments in achieving energy autonomy by designing them to find their recharge stations. They emulate the wisdom of natural living systems, for example, like ant colonies, demonstrating how life can give rise to itself based on genetic instructions. Here, the robots were, in this case, built virtually entirely in 3D software, and then they were created using rapid prototyping machines. Presumably, if you had a system, you could continue to give rise to these autotelematic spider bots via robotic rapid prototyping and given the instructions directly from these 3D software. Just as real spiders have multiple eyes for different distances, these spider bots have shorter distance infrared eyes, allowing them to see and avoid each other while randomly foraging for food. For the spider bots, food is a recharge station within the surrounding ring. The robots maintain equidistance from each other and the walls by emitting coded infrared pulses from small aluminum tubes at their midsections, creating an infrared apron around each bot. 
You'll also see LEDs illuminating the clear acrylic plastic molds. These robots communicate with each other and interact using audible chirping sounds from small amplified speakers attached to their frames. These speakers amplify the twittering sounds during human interaction. Viewers can also sense the emotional responses of the spider bots through the tones they emit. The spiders also communicate through Bluetooth, allowing a central robot to communicate their activities as they interacted, singing and telling where the recharge station is. The robots were designed to find their food source through random foraging, ser searching for that one hertz infrared beacon located under the recharge rail. One of the robots also has a mini video camera and transmitters to project its vision into the installation walls. The signal is displayed on the screen with a built-in Voronoi-like patterns, giving viewers a sense of being captured in the robot's web. The screen also shows the spiders on a larger scale than the viewer subtly manipulating the power dynamics of the human-robot relationship. In the case of the tones, higher tones are associated with fear and repulsion, while lower tones indicate regular food recharging. And um, I think we have a little bit of video here I could show. I think the project really came to an exciting fruition when I saw this very exciting paper by a doctor of entomology, Dr. Guy Thériuz, and he said basically that ants were uh, rule-driven systems. And I realized at that moment that, well, if that's the case, knowing that computers are in fact rule-driven systems, could you create a series of autonomous robots that would be able to act like ants? So in essence, what you have is you have a series of robots that roughly look like spiders that seek out their food like ants, but that see like bats. Uh, as with spiders, they have multiple eyes. In this case, these spiders uh, have infrared eyes that are sending out a pulse of infrared light and looking for a frequency back. If you actually look at the robots, you'll see at the front of the robots, there's a couple of springs right here. And uh, as with a spider, the chelicerae of the spider brings the food into the mouth of the spider. Well, these are the chelicerae of the robot. And what happens is when the robot approaches a recharge station, it then connects between these two rails and then charges the battery up. So the next work I'd like to show you is a brand new series. And Signs is an experimental film and also a socially engaged artwork and action. It challenges us to rethink the critical message we often ignore in our urban environments. This film and socially engaged work compels us to confront unseen environmental impacts of our daily activities, although with all the fires and rain, certainly we're seeing these, re these results. And we know the relentless use of cars and driving and trucks and FedEx trucks all have significant carbon emissions. Like the cigarette packs years ago that were showing things like cancer and so on, it occurred to me that probably the best way to address car usage, by the way, I'm an avid bike rider, is basically to create signs and put them out into the environment. However, I didn't want to be arrested, so I did place the signs. I left many of them up for a while, but I also created a film to distribute their messages far more widely. It urges us to imagine how urban science could effectively communicate the interconnectedness of technology, climate change, rising sea levels, and natural disasters. These are issues that are intricately linked yet rarely highlighted in the signage that fills our cities. Science also pushes the boundaries of information spaces, advocating for signs that promote social justice, question the pervasive collection and sale of our personal data, and also alert us the potential infringement of our rights through everyday consumer choices. The Signs and Film asks us to envision signage that prompts deeper reflection on societal issues and pervasive impacts of modern technology. With their potential for immediate and impactful communication, signs can reconnect us to an ancient pictographic understanding that transcends language barriers to convey universal messages. The Signs series here is warning, racial bias ahead. Here's one called shared breath. I think this one goes well actually with uh, some of Andrea's work. Here's one that uh, is basically signs of life. 
and signs of death. It invites viewers to scrutinize the messages missing from our daily landscape and to question the signs around us and if they truly serve the public good by warning us of unseen yet impending dangers and ecological crises. Here's one that conflates the tales of airplanes crashing into the earth. Of course, everybody could see that this is a COVID. Uh, I placed this near the airport. And then this one here is called Your Exhaust, basically contributes to the heat of seven Hiroshima bombs absorbed by the oceans each and every second. If people are wondering why the oceans are getting so hot, of course, we all know now it's because the oceans are our primarily heat sink. And imagine seven Hiroshima bombs absorb the heat equivalent each and every second of the day. We know this is brought to us by BMW and Ford and all the other uh, carbon polluting corporations out there. We are of course killing the primary oxygen source on the planet. Most of the oxygen we breathe actually comes from algae, anywhere from 50 to 80% of them. One solution is simply to end freeways. And so we must end freeways because freeways are not really free. They have real costs and we are all now experiencing those costs. This was the first sign and reference as well, the next work I will show and which I will wrap up with. The work the entire consciousness features an artificial stomach with a culture of symbiotic bacteria that controls a functioning robotic massage chair shaped like a giant tongue. This robotic tongue is massaged by an artificial or managed by an artificial stomach filled with the same bacteria lactobacillus acidophilus that inhabit our natural stomachs. Our stomachs and intestinal systems known as the enteric nervous system are considered forms of intelligence. They possess one one thousandth the number of neurons in the human brain and use many of the same neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. Just as the hand and fingers are extensions of the human brain, the tongue can be seen as an extension of the enteric nervous system, seeking out what it prefers to ingest. In this installation, the artificial stomach allows the bacteria within it to activate the robotic tongue, which provide a comforting massage. However, only if the bacteria in the artificial stomach are alive and healthy. And here's uh, the artificial stomach. Very much appreciated seeing in Andrea's work, all the beautiful glass and fine arts glass. And so this is an example of one of my fine art glass works that's holding the uh, bacteria itself, controlling the robotic tongue. Part of the installation also featured two robotic tongues, which dipped in and out of pools of chocolate suspended by dopamine molecules. This is me getting my 15 minute massage. Okay, in this work, I was also interested in the skin, noting that little interactive art at the time dealt with touch directly. I wanted to engage the largest organ on our bodies, our skin. And I think I have a little bit of video and I'll fast forward through the video in the interest of time because we're looking forward to the next um, person. Consciousness is a large robotic tongue controlled by an artificial stomach. This artificial stomach is filled with the same living bacteria, Lactobacillus acidophilus, that occupy our own natural stomachs. Our stomachs and intestinal systems are called the enteric nervous system and are certainly seen as forms of intelligence as they possess one thousandth of the numbers of neurons in the human brain and use many of the same neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. If the hand and finger can be seen as extensions of our human brain, then the tongue can be thought of as an extension of the enteric nervous system, seeking out what it prefers to ingest. So in the interest of time, I have some more works to show, but I think um, I will go on to the next thing. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Ken. Was, Thank you. I want. I want more of this uh, <laughs> on, <ask>. on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ken is going to join us again for another laser uh, next week. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. And uh, Ken's four-minute 
uh, video uh, signs is also going to be shown here in Telluride. Uh, we may show it uh, in one of the Zooms if we have some time, uh, but signs is going to be uh, preceding the feature documentary on Georgi Kepish, which is being shown in Telluride for a local audience, not online, uh, on Thursday, August 1st. Right now, I want to move over to Ricardo Dalfara. Um, and I'll just uh, briefly introduce Ricardo by saying that uh, in 1989, I believe it was, uh, Ricardo um, received an invitation to participate in a program called Composer to Composer. Uh, it was a, uh, for a few years, Charles Amerkanian in the Bay Area and John Lifton and the Telluride Institute hosted um, a uh, multi-day working meeting uh, and gathering among international new music composers of all varieties. Uh, and uh, Ricardo was a young Argentinian uh, composer who was invited and actually came to Telluride. Uh, to be among John Cage and Conlon Nancaro and uh, many, many others that uh, he's told me had a, a real influence on the following years of his life and career. So I'm glad Ricardo made it to Telluride and welcome back virtually to Telluride, Ricardo. And you're on. Thank you so much, Richard. Yes, was a life-changing experience. Let me share the screen. Um, yes, I'm not going to talk a lot about my work as an artist or composer. I'm going to talk about other things I have been doing during the past years and I'm still doing. So first, thank you once again, uh, Richard. And I'm happy also to listen to the work of once again of Ken and Andrea that I like very much. So um, let me show you this picture that I found really not a long time ago. I found it <laughs> a few years ago. So for me it was, yes. I mean, let me tell you very briefly what happened. I think I gave a cassette, audio cassette to Joseph Chelly that probably gave the cassette to Jin Hee Kim that probably gave that cassette to Charles Amir Canyon. And what happened was that uh, one day I arrived to the house of my parents and there was an envelope. I cannot understand how that envelope was not lost, stolen, or whatever. I opened the envelope that was just outside in the front garden of the house, and there was a check. <laughs> there was a check to buy my ticket to Telluride. Yes, and I was there together with all the people you can see there. I mean, Nancaro, Cage, Subotnik, Lori Spiegel, Laura Kuhn, Julio Estrada, Tania Leon, Trimpin, Belia it was really, uh, really amazing. It was a fantastic experience for me. And, and don't for forget Trimpin. I see Trimpin. Yes, 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 Trimpin. Trimpin too. And I'm uh, not everyone is on the picture, but I mean, we were like 13 guests, if I remember well. So I also played a piece uh, with live electronics and a komungo, a Korean instrument with Jin Hee Kim live in the Sheridan Opera House. I'm not going to play it now because I want to talk about other things, but at least I wanted to mention this and later if we have time, I can play a few seconds. So let me talk about other things I have been doing that I find is in, in relevant to this uh, gathering of laser because I'm trying to put together ideas about the information ecology that we have been talking, uh, Richard, and the relevance of communications to build understanding, uh, to produce knowledge and to build understanding, basically. For many, many years, like maybe 35 years or so, I have been compiling Latin American electroacoustic music that was in my house in, in Buenos Aires until I said, well, I cannot be working like an institution and being alone doing all these things. So, Many years after I started to collect this, and considering that Argentina and Latin America in general, the people have been starting to do uh, electroacoustic music almost, almost at the same time than in Europe. I mean, you can see here 
that Mauricio Cagel from Argentina was already in the early 50s producing electroacoustic music, or people like Juan Blanco in Cuba. He was producing this blueprint of what it became after the Mellotron. The official history is going to tell you that the Mellotron was invented in a different country, as in the usual countries, I would say, if you allow me. But well before that, uh, Juan Blanco in Cuba did this blueprint of what it became. It is basically the idea of the Mellotron that became years after the digital sampler. Or Fernando von Reichenbach in Argentina was producing these devices where you could draw and the drawings, is, we are talking about the mid sixties, the, the drawing were converted into analog signals and this was used to, to, to control um, voltage control uh, processors and, and generators. And years after Senakis was doing this in Paris, uh, but not uh, analog in analog ways anymore, but in digital using digital means. So all this uh, thinking about uh, disseminating devices, technologies, producing in Latin America, music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I started to produce a number of of uh, radio programs, concert series, etc. So uh, with Leonardo, we published this in Spanish. Can you believe it? MIT. Press was publishing this Musica Electroacústica de Compositores Latinoamericanos in 1994, 30 years from now. So this was done by, it took me two years to produce this. I mean, we are talking almost when internet was not available for, for most of us. I said, never again, I'm going to do a project like this. And of course, a few years after I did it again and I did another, another compilation of Latin American electroacoustic music and I said, never again, this is too complex, it has been a nightmare to produce this. And in 2000, 1999, Computer Music Journal contacted me to, to make the curator of a CD. And then I did for Computer Music Journal another CD with a collection of pieces of Latin American composers. But yes, music was starting to move around, uh, but um, there was not much written about this. So with the Digi Arts project with UNESCO, I, I was hired, I think it was the first contract they did, uh, to produce a compilation of uh, electroacoustic uh, music in Latin America. So I wrote two big reports, one in English, one in Spanish, that were expanding, not with comments and, and general ideas or concepts, but mostly with facts about who was producing what, where, when, et cetera, et cetera. It was a lot, a lot, a lot of work. But then there were words and there were some music in CDs or recordings or concerts, but then I moved my full collection uh, to the Daniel Langla Foundation and we created the Latin American Electroacoustic Music Collection uh, that is hosted by the foundation in Montreal. Uh, this collection costs about 1,723 pieces that you can listen uh, full fr uh, fully free online. And we have more than 200,000 words about the history and the works of Latin American electroacoustic music. Because the idea is basically to understand what was happening and then to try to see if the story that was told, it is the real story, or it maybe it was, we were forgetting part of it. As usual, I mean, story is being told by the winners. So the, the point will be, who are the winners of the electroacoustic music in this case, because part of the story was almost erased. So recently I was publishing 17 pages in the Computer Music Journal, and the title was, I hope you can understand the double sense that we are very ironic, the people coming from Buenos Aires. So part of computer music history, trust me, Latin America has always been there, even, even if many things were not mentioned for a very long time. So let me talk about some other projects that I think are interesting and linked to our gathering today. This Amauta Media Art Center we produced, we, we were living in, in Peru, in Cusco, in the middle of the mountains, Cusco, the heart of the, what it was the Incas Empire. So in this place, we were living a Media Art Center that was gathering 
maybe people coming from the university are independent artists and we were uh, facilitating the access to technology that people that maybe had a lot of ideas but didn't have the possibilities. And I need to say that I learned a lot because, you know, when you have not only artists and people coming that uh, with university studies, but maybe a shaman was coming and we were seeing how they were relating to other cosmologies and other cultures and a different point of view. I really learned a lot in Cusco about the connection between, yes, art, science and technology, but other cosmologies that people could manage and myself coming from a big city like Buenos Aires um, for me I understood one cosmology and I met a lot of people uh, coming from ancient cultures that they can talk to me about different perspectives about the world and was really a very interesting uh, process for me because the idea is that for me art is, is not just about it even if I was talking about the past first and then about the present in some way with Cusco. But the idea is always to think about the building, the construction of, of the future. So another project I started to do, so I left a little bit the past. And at some point I said, okay, everything is changing fast. We are in deep problems. And then I started a series called Balance and Balance that was basically relating art, science, technology, with the problems of society, focusing on the environmental crisis and our responsibility on all the things that were happening. And many of the people participating in, the, in this series, like uh, Andrea uh, or Richard was, uh, were participating of some balance and balance encounters that were producing in different places because the idea was mainly to look for possible solutions coming from art, from science, from melting all these things, possible solutions related to the environmental crisis. So the interesting thing about Balance and Balance was that you could meet a biologist with an astrophysicist, with a media artist, with engineers, and this was not happening in other places. Today it's becoming a little bit more common, but usually still we work in projects connecting individual people, but to find a place where you can talk to maybe 100, 200, 300 people coming from very different places with the common, with the common umbrella, with the common interest of finding solutions to the problems of the climate change and the environmental crisis in general were really important. So we did it in Buenos Aires first in 2000 and then in Montreal in 2011. And then we did it um, in the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And we started to get, I mean, attention from many different people and institutions. And we were working with the Red Cross Climate Center. Leonardo was also disseminating information uh, around the balance and balance. And some people from Leonardo and from the Red Cross Climate Center were participating in almost every balance and balance. Then in Arizona State University, where we're doing it in 2015, 2016, we were doing it in Colombia, where the situation was quite the opposite, because in this case, the problem in Arizona was the lack of water, basically, and what is becoming soon a huge problem there. And here is the opposite problem. Sometimes you have too much water, at least in certain regions of Colombia, not in every region. Or uh, then we did it in, in, in the UK, in Plymouth University, but also we went to Cornwall to the Eden Project and we were celebrating 50 years of Leonardo in, in these big domes. There were, there were different biodomes that were um, basically emulating different situations. And in these places, we were talking, as I said, with engineers, scientists, artists, designers, and more. And, we all were learning a lot of things. In the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, we did in 2018, when we were talking about new value systems related to the economy on one side, but also the values, values, I mean, the ethical, as a value, I mean, it's the social impact that all the things were producing. So Anne Nichten was uh, leading the way to help us to do this in, 
in Rotterdam. And we did experiences like very unusual, were not only the things that we were doing before, like yes, panels, uh, exhibitions, concerts, uh, paper presentations, but we were doing really, as you can see in this photo, other kind of experiences where we were crossing things between the neighborhood, the scientists and designers and artists, et cetera, et cetera, with people that were coming to a place for uh, preparing food, for example. So the people were not only in an audience seated, we had that too, but also we were moving around and we were talking maybe 30 seconds with this person, but I mean, we were talking half an hour with the other person. We were creating an ecology of communication that was also for me a learning, very interesting learning process. And when the pandemic arrived, uh, we started to change like everyone, we started to change the, the approach. So we were doing smaller activities several times a year, but smaller activities sometimes linked to other uh, organizations, institutions, and events like uh, think tanks. Uh, in this case, we were joining people from the Red Cross Climate Center, curator Roger Malina from Leonardo, um, Leah Barkley from Australia, some artists. So we were started to produce think tanks and also like series related to balance and balance, bringing people from many different places from all over the world um, and not just a, a few countries, but really trying to join people that were having very different knowledge and different experiences from people working on political science, uh, artists, again, maybe people coming from certain companies also. I mean, we were trying to, or politicians, trying to understand the different perspectives. And as an example, recently this year, we were presenting just um, a round table, a session, well, a couple of sessions, linking balance and balance and what we call cultural intelligence. And this was done in the International IMAS Festival between Manizales and Bogota in, in Colombia just a couple of months ago. Let me go to the, to the last part and talking a little bit about transdisciplinarity and our, our project we have now is called Cyber Villages. Um, this, this was done also in Manizales in Colombia. You know, like people coming to study a, a master on media art, but maybe coming with different experiences in their bachelor. So maybe one was a teacher, the other was coming from visual art, the other were a scientist. And then we had a very few hours and in a couple of days, we were crossing ideas and links in areas that in principle, they were not experts in spite of that. These people were producing in, in just two days, a fast survey and projecting ideas. Like for example, in this case, a food lab uh, making a survey of what was the situation in Manizales, in this uh, city of half a million population in Colombia, of how much food was wasted, was thrown away, uh, what was from the percentage of the food produced, how much was really consumed, uh, what was good food, what if uh, there was a stain or something dark, you know, in some fruits or vegetables, if this was thrown away or not. So. In a few hours, we produce so many things, so many results that, I mean, if we can devote more time with people exchanging ideas from different fields, how much we can reach. So part of that idea, and I'm applying this in my classes, I have a class called Transdisciplinary Creation and Performance in, in Concordia University in Montreal. It is a music class. But the people that come to talk to the class are anthropologists, dancers, uh, space scientists, a magician, truck drivers, um, designers, uh, bioengineers, all kinds of people, because we need to understand how other people think, even if we don't agree. But we need to understand what's the point about seeing the world in a certain way so we can produce changes. I think that's the only way or probably one of the few ways. So recently, a few months ago, we started a project called Cyber Villages with people from the US, Colombia, and um, Argentina, and other places. It's a small group. And we're trying to see, not uh, 
not to talk about um, smart cities. We prefer to call it cyber villages because we, we focus on smaller projects. We started to apply this in, with a group of students I took from Canada to Colombia during the recent Image Festival in Bogota that I was mentioning before. And we made a, a workshop trying to see ideas of the students and to propose different ways of uh, how to change the future. Where are we going? What we want? And how to change what it looks like unavoidable in the future. So can we produce? Can we build a better future? So that was basically the goal. So that was part of my presentation after the workshop in the Image Festival. Uh, and I'm showing there um, from a cartoonist in Argentina, Kino, uh, he was showing this person seated in the middle of a big library and he knew so much and he's saying, well, now that I know so much, what, what are we going to do with all our knowledge? So that was part of the challenge of all these ideas because I find that communication, the ecology of communication, I see it as a fundamental factor for the survival of our species and of much of the life on this planet in general. So just to finish, let me mention that in the middle of all these activities, um, we are uh, going to uh, to bring uh, the laser series to another, a new university in Montreal. And so I thought it was the proper place to, to announce it. The last image here is this one also from Kino that I was mentioning before. Kino is showing like the parents are telling the student the, or the, the son, okay, how bad he was doing things because in the square world, in this square world, he was drawing something in circle. So nobody could understand why he was doing this, but that's probably what we need. Someone think differently and we can produce different results. I was mentioning the laser series before. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you all. Thank you, Ricardo. That was wonderful. Um, and um, I guess we'll now uh, go to Ken, uh, no, to Sean Brixey. And uh, I think uh, when I reconnected with Sean uh, in just recent past about this program, we recalled uh, meeting at the Center for Advanced Visual Studies on their 25th anniversary, I think 1991, something like that. Uh, I lived in Telluride at that time, and uh, um, I, I was impressed with Sean then, and we had probably no communication between then and recently, and yet uh, I, I tended to follow Sean's work online to some degree. Uh, uh, he'll be, Sean will be part of another session uh, also and uh, talk about some projects he won't talk about now or add to those and so on. But uh, Sean, take it away. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, uh, delighted to be here. It was great to connect with you after all these years. Um, and at the same time to my colleagues, uh, to uh, Ricardo and to Ken and to Andrea, it's just great to see what you're up to, um, learn a little bit more of the sort of the stories, the backstories, the things that fuel the frontiers of your imagination. Uh, um, rather than introduce myself like in depth, uh, I think what I'm gonna do is I'll actually do it through the presentation if that's okay with everyone. I'll just simply say for those who are not, you know, part of the, uh, of the laser, but maybe who are um, a part of the uh, community that's watching. I'm an MIT trained, uh, educated artist, researcher, inventor, working uh, at the interface of art, science, and technology, pioneering primarily experimental artworks that synthesize physics, astronomy, cosmology, biology, and advanced computing. I'll do the rest through sort of uh, the introduction uh, through the actual presentation of my work. I took a slightly different approach today. I hope it's okay with everyone. Um, uh, Andrea and I were talking about being parents, and it's uh, an extraordinarily exciting thing, but at the same time, you think a lot about um, uh, your history and where you come from and how you're influenced. Um, and so my presentation is just simply from simulation to emulation information and the uncanny intimacy of distance. Um, 
And the first slide that I uh, will kind of go through is the, the topics that I want to cover today is uh, simulation to emulation, which are fundamentally different uh, sort of concepts, uh, inertial frames of reference, which is really sort of a term that comes primarily from my years of uh, studying physics at MIT and temporal and scalar distance. Um, my parents, my father was an actor on Broadway and my mom was a symphony cellist. Uh, in San Francisco before the war. They were uh, both, uh, they both fought in World War II. My father in Corregidor, Saipan, Iwo Jima, um, a really tough environment. When, when they came back, my father's sort of acting career and my mother's symphony career had so fundamentally changed that they were recruited into network television. And so I actually grew up on the floor of a network television studio uh, as a kid. Uh, and uh, for me, I actually thought my parents teleported people until I was probably about six or seven years old, which is like a really magical concept. I, I won't say I was disappointed to find out that it was just the rasterized image that was being transmitted, but that sort of force um, of being transported from one place to another, this sort of uncanny intimacy yet being at this extraordinary distance was really woven into, you know, growing up uh, uh, in an era of the, uh, of the moon landing, sort of all of this being, you know, highly influenced by all of this. I could draw and paint, uh, exceptionally well, almost like I had been in an Italian atelier as a, a small child. It was just a, a natural thing that I had. I luckily was accepted into the Kansas City Art Institute. Uh, really uh, amazing alumni there, Walt Disney, uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, Robert Rauschenberg. But because I could actually do things that sometimes other students were really there to learn, I was distractible and I was probably not the best student, but they had a solution for those kinds of students. They would pack you in a school bus and give you enough food to last for 15 hours, an, an art bin box and a military shovel. Then they would drive you about 200 miles into Western Kansas. It looked exactly like this. And they basically said, you're going to fail art school unless you do uh, one of these projects. If you want to be a painter, um, you make a perfect line. If you want to be a sculptor, you make a perfect moment. And then they would drive away and they would come back and critique your work uh, about 12 hours later. Um, I fell asleep in the hot sun. I woke up. I had a panic attack. The very first thing that I did was dig a hole. Uh, I took the big five gallons of water that they gave me and I cut the lid off of it and I laid it down. And I took some wheat chafe because I was raised, you know, basically as a farm kid. Uh, and I magnetized uh, a needle and I laid it on the top of the of the pond of water that I had. And in a few minutes, maybe 30 minutes or so, the the um, bus came back and everyone came out and the professors didn't even say a word. They just ushered me onto the um, onto the bus. And what they had realized that I had done, because if you understand some basic physics, uh, basically by producing a magnet, I had sort of created a line that circumscribed the globe 24,000 miles unerringly. And because of the Faraday lines, I had actually projected all future lines. And at the same time, the Earth is in a tensor field. Its magnetic field is always in a state of becoming, but it never really is, right? Because it's constantly changing. So sort of like the, you know, drawing the sword from the stone, like King Arthur, uh, I had sort of slayed this maybe problem that they had been giving to students for probably 20 or 30 years. And I came back and I was really, really fascinated, not so much that I had done something, you know, magical or interesting, but that I wanted to understand where it came from. Uh, but they had something else in store for me. So they apprenticed me to Dale Eldred, the sculptor who was the chair of sculpture at that time. And so rather than actually being in art school, I traveled all over the world with him. We shaved our heads. We all wore paramilitary fatigues. The young women and the men all dressed the same. If you went to a restaurant, uh, he would order one of everything on the menu and then copy it again until everyone was fed. We would do these very large projects um, that would take over entire museums. This is the Nelson Atkins Museum. It's called Time Incident, where uh, giant mirrors on the outside of the building uh, would reflect beams of light for three minutes inside. They'd turn off all the lights where there'd be precious Caravaggios, uh, extraordinary works in, in almost like the pyramids of Cheops. Uh, these sort of extraordinary time incident moments would occur. I was working with Dale and we were doing a project in... Um, 
Phoenix, Arizona, and I was asked to drive the semi-tractor trailer. And we paused in Green River, Utah, and everyone got out. And the driver was the last one who got to go back in because we were going to lay down in bunk beds in the back. And when I came out, they had all left. And we had welded two gas tanks onto every truck that we had so they could go 1,500 miles without stopping. So I was basically alone um, uh, at dawn in the middle of nowhere. So I um, took a quarter out of my pocket at a truck stop and I put it in a gumball machine and I thought I'd get a tattoo or I'd get a compass or something, but out came uh, an entire Bible. And I uh, walked out on the highway and there was no one really there. And I thought of Archimedes that, you know, this tiny thing in my hand was sort of the fulcrum of at least the Western world for many thousands of years. It wasn't my a religious experience for me, but it was one that was conceptually fundamental. And Archimedes basically said, if you give me the proper fulcrum and a lever, I can move the universe. So I left the Art Institute. I went to MIT. I was in the first generation of the Media Lab uh, and uh, studied, of course, uh, uh, under uh, Stephen Benson. Uh, you'll see maybe later in a few minutes, my work uh, deals a lot with um, uh, holography and optics. Uh, and uh, I was also apprenticed to uh, Otto Pina at CAVS, which is where Richard and I met. Uh, and I was interested that, you know, um, uh, Andrea had mentioned uh, Harold Edgerton, Doc Edgerton. I was his last graduate student. And then, of course, um, uh, Ricardo mentioned uh, John Cage. And so I was apprenticed to Cage and Pike and to Mormon uh, to be their lab assistant. So our lives, the four of us who are talking today, we, didn't, we may not have bumped into each other very much, but we really crossed paths quite significantly. So I did the first uh, Leonardo postdoc uh, at the University of Michigan. Then I was a distinguished visiting scholar at uh, Cranbrook went on to found the digital media program at the University of Kentucky. Similarly, the in interdisciplinary arts program at the University of Washington. I was the founder of the New Media Institute at San Francisco State University. Went on to found the Berkeley Center for New Media at uh, UC Berkeley, then became the um, founder of the PhD program this, at the Center for Digital Arts and Experimental Media uh, at the University of Washington. And um, then on to found the uh, School of the Media Arts Performance and Design, um, at York University, which had fundamentally, which had been the faculty uh, of uh, fine arts, as um, uh, Ricardo would know. Uh, and then I moved on here to um, Richmond, and I'm uh, currently a um, retired dean, but a professor of arts and of engineering here. Uh, I take a great deal of pride in the work that I do, primarily winning awards uh, in fields that I don't belong in. Uh, and um, uh, those were a list of a few of them. I thought I would talk a bit about research frontiers at this point. Um, a key thing that is important that I mentioned earlier is the difference between simulation and emulation. Um, simulation on the left, imagine that we have a full force feedback immersive cave and we might be able to spend $50 million uh, to simulate an apple. However, even no matter how precise it is, we'll always know that it's not real but a low level emulation might be a $5 plastic apple from Target. And the reason that it's a higher order uh, of implementation is because it resides in the same phenomenological universe that we do, right? It's not inside of a screen or simulation. And a high level emulation would basically be an apple, but created not through propagation, but through any other means. So the first project that I'm gonna talk about and I'm going to do these quickly, it's called Photon Voice. And it was a National Endowment for the Arts funded project where I created a 94 million mile transmission line between the sun and the earth to use radiation pressure, the intense <clears throat> pressure from the sunlight to actually teleport uh, a dancer uh, moving um, uh, uh, 50 meters away in the desert. Um, uh, most people don't realize this. Of course, we a lot of you know that it takes eight minutes, 22 seconds for uh, light to you know go from the sun to the surface of the earth. Uh, but when it strikes the surface of the earth, photons don't have any mass, right? They don't weigh anything, but they can impart their kinetic momentum. And on a flat surface like this, it's about six pounds per square mile. If, however, you have a reflective surface, it actually ends up being about 12 pounds per square mile. So similar to solar one, uh, which is the giant um, uh, solar engine uh, in the desert. I created four heliostats, which track the sun, they're mirrors downrange, and they project three thousandths of a gram of radiation pressure to the big lens that you see on your right. 
And there's a dancer that actually moves in front of the mirrors, decreasing and increasing the amount of light uh, that's transmitted downrange. Now, uh, these mirrors actually track the sun for a little over three minutes. Uh, and the speaker array that you see on the surface here have mylar on them, and they are um, uh, having sound that actually makes the surface um, undulate. This is a lot like Hans Jene's chimatics, but Hans Jene didn't actually transmit data. So these speakers actually transmit data and radiation pressure inside of the light. And so as the photons actually are captured by this large lens, they're focused to an infinitesimally small point, and each particle inside of an evacuated flask begins to spin much the same way that a dancer does or a skater does on the ice. They increase in mass uh, through inertia. Here's the particles in an evacuated flask. This was on um, Smithsonian World Television. Uh, each particle is uh, hit by a giant ultrasonic transducer, breaks apart the Vanderveil's forces. Each particle spins the same way that a planet would in a solar system or a solar system would be in a galaxy. And the light that's reflected off of them actually has voice that's encoded and is decoded uh, by uh, sensors that are basically picking up um, like a, an eccentric choir of uh, thousands of voices. So you can think of it like this, gravity fluctuations created by voice encoded radiation pressure cause behavior of levitated graphite particles in a vacuum to mirror words encoded in the light. So here's a project that I did for the 20th anniversary of the Hubble telescope. On the far right is a 500 million candle power light source. It goes through a series of lenses. It focuses into the center of this evacuated flask. There are two microscopes, one with stereo uh, cameras so that you can wear 3D glasses and walk into it. And on the far left are optical engines that convert the light, the scattered light uh, into electricity and electricity into sound. Because my parents were television producers, I understood the concept of, um, of subcarrier. So the light source on the right side similarly was like an AM radio station, and it would actually have uh, um, an amplitude modulated uh, signal of uh, uh, anyone in the world could type in sort of a message and communicate uh, to the center of this. And in this case, it was poetry. And then the poetry would create the gravity for the particles that were levitated on the inside. And as they would spin, they would Doppler shift uh, the, um, uh, the sound that's reflected off of each one of the graphite particles. And what you end up having is this, as I said earlier, this crazy eccentric choir of voices saying sort of the same poetry over and over. This is a stereo image in 3D. Uh, I don't think you need to you know, cross your eyes, but you can if you'd like to. Um, and this is a binary system. So often we would find that uh, inside of this vacuum, which is four times 10 to the negative four torr, which is better than outer space, uh, you would have these systems that would develop that were uncannily similar to what we would find in um, large scale cosmological structures. The next project is Sky Chasm, which I did for uh, Documenta 8 uh, in coastal Germany. It is a dramatic time travel um, performance uh, that measures the uh, quantum phase entanglement between two photon pairs. So um, many of you have been to Documenta in Kassel, Germany, and those of you who have ever built a holography lab or worked in a laser lab know that you don't do it outside. Uh, this is a very <laughs> challenging thing to do. Um, but this is a basic interferometer, the kind that we would use to measure the speed of light or, um, you know, very small um, uh, measurements of, of uh, certain kinds that we would use optical instruments for. You can see the laser on the right side. It goes through a series of mirrors and then lenses and then onto a screen. Uh, similarly, the way that we make a hologram, we do it a little differently. We go through a beam splitter and then we send the beam of light in two directions and we bounce it off of two mirrors. One goes onto an object and then one goes directly to a holographic plate. The interference pattern actually um, captures, right, the not the irradiance distribution, which is what we would with a photograph, but the phase relationship of the photons and then records that. So what I had done, which was somewhat similar, but also really different than anyone had ever done before, I put the lens in front of the beam splitter. And then I had two mirrors that would actually um, uh, measure 
sort of the distance or the time travel distance between a photon pair and when they're brought back together. So this is a magnified image of a few wavelengths of light. It's magnified probably 250 million uh, times its actual size. If any one of us were sort of thinking about the scalar distance, which is what I mentioned earlier, us to the size or the earth to the size, uh, the scalar distance to the sun is the same scalar distance of us to the size of one of these red or one of these dark rings, which is just a single wavelength of light. The system was so sensitive that the time dilation of the phase entangled pairs, if any fluctuation occurred, whether that was a heartbeat, uh, whether it was a blink of an eye, it would register that. So we had to isolate it on the ground uh, so that all of the people at Documenta, of course, wouldn't trigger sort of the, like the uh, overload of sensitivity. And we would be able to record sort of not only a nightly performance, uh, but all of the crowd sort of fundamental movements. It's this beautiful sort of trilling um, uh uh, heartbeat-like sound. Uh, I didn't have recordings today because I, I wasn't sure sort of the, the quality that we would have on the, on Zoom. We would record these, however, and then retransmit them using similar technology that I did uh, in the desert for Desert Sun, Desert Moon, eight miles away to the Herculean Monument. And this would be the surface of one of the mirrorized mylar um, reflectors being taken at ultra high speed uh, high speed photographs. The performer would form in absolute silence, but the performance would then be transmitted via light. So anyone who had a set of headphones in these very special detectors could actually re like listen to the performance in situ from the previous evening. And then we transmitted it eight kilometers away via the reflection uh, to a series of sensors uh, and uh, sound receiving devices um, uh, uh, in Germany. I'm watching the time very carefully. Um, the uh, project, I think um, uh, it was Ricardo who mentioned, and maybe Andrea mentioned, um, uh, Marta de Menezes. Uh, so one of the projects that I did for Marta was at Emergencias, and it was called Voltaire um, in Guimarães, Portugal, as part of the Capital of Culture uh, for the European Union in 2012 through 2014. Um, when we're small children, we're all told that no two snowflakes are alike, and that's true because when they fall, they basically are recordings, atomic recordings of their history. They use heat dissipation, uh, surface tension, supersaturation. But in a laboratory, um, I've been able to purify the water so much that I can reduce its ability to freeze to minus 40 degrees below zero, 41 degrees below zero Celsius. It's also the same at Fahrenheit because that's when they meet. And then what I do is I take material that I have as a similar uh, uh, atomic epitaxy. Uh, and when I use similar materials, I can dope that material the way that we do semiconductors and I can copy or create snowflakes in this case uh, that never could have occurred in nature. Or for the Voltaire project, we actually used ice core samples from the last glacial maximum, which was 20,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, copied moments in time that are disappearing due to climate change. Uh, I was listening very carefully to Ken's presentation. Uh, so Voltaire is not actually a time machine where the ice that I've cloned is, is thousands of years old, right? 20,000 years old. It's actually more remarkably 20,000 years ago. So it's a time machine. It's brand new, but it's ancient at the same time. And we can do lots of scientific measurements to confirm that it's uh, indeed uh, a copy of uh, those um, sources. So I, my original project that started with this, and I was interested in all of the work that everyone else had done and how it had evolved, was actually for the Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan, where I used the blood and urine of athletes to assay out metabolite steroids. Then I would dope the ice crystals or the, you know, sort of the, the, the pure, uh, um, uh, uh, snow that they would perform on to sort of make, you know, uh, crystals that would never occur in nature. Uh, but uh, um, the project that I did for um, uh, the European Union, the capital of culture was at um, uh, Fabrica SA. Uh, the ice core samples were taken from the uh, Greenland Neem ice core uh, facility about 1650 meters down. Uh, there's a huge library of um, I felt incredibly blessed that my um, research partners would allow me to have uh, some of those components. Uh, the gallery that I was placed in was uh, uh, Gallery G, which was the former chiller for the huge factory. 
uh, where they made uh, military uniforms for World War II and automobile seats and things like that. So it's freezing, freezing cold plate place, had the ice core samples uh, shipped in, uh, immediately uh, preparing them for a, a very special freezer that will go from room temperature to minus uh, 25 in just a few minutes. Um, uh, backlit panels, uh, anti-cavitating machines that would allow for the uh, uniform temperature um, on the uh, side of the crystals, uh, on the side of the system. Uh, there was a, a telepresent or robotic arm that would allow you to move a, a camera back and forth and take postcards. Um, most, it, it's, it's sort of hard to imagine, but you know, when a snowflake falls, it grows, right? It actually grows off of its edges and contours, but the way in which the process occurs when you're doping is it happens like this, like instantaneously, uh, because you're using original crystal, right? And material and water that's dying to go from liquid to a solid through a phase change. So it ultimately wants to, you know, make this phase change happen, you know, as quick as it can. And so we don't go through heat dissipation. We don't do any of the other process, but you know, it explosively changes. Uh, and so these are what the crystals look like. Um, and uh, Guimarães, Portugal, they were uh, projected, of course, uh, outside uh, in, the, um, in the gallery, but at the same time, they uh, were uh, available via the internet. You can see the freezer with the camera that would be able to move up and down, uh, left and right in this freezing room. Uh, some of these crystals are just in the process of freezing. I have other photographs where we actually take copies of copies or clones of clones. And I've got a short video here uh, to show you what they look like. If you're being extremely nerdy, you can sort of think through that the stress on the atomic lattice between the two materials is not perfect. Uh, and when they meet, uh, the epitaxially actually forces the lattice to stress. Uh, so the colors actually can be measured to determine the amount of force uh, that's required for the two materials to sort of meet. Uh, and to um, connect with one another. I'm watching my time. I'll pull out here in just a second. Uh, Altamir is the project that I did uh, for um, uh, 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 for Eben Fisher. Um, I like to think that we're more than a hundred year biological vessel, but we're actually million year creatures embedded in a billion year process. And what I did here is when we were small children, I used the giant uh, telescopes uh, in... Um, uh, Sirocco, New Mexico, right? Uh, and also the first ones were done actually in um, with Haystack. Uh, and when you're a small child, many of you remember pushing your hands on your eyes and you'd see these phenomenal patterns. Those are called phosphenes, mechanical phosphenes. Uh, and they produce sodium and potassium ions, cascade down the optic nerve. The brain doesn't know what to do with it. It assumes that it's light. So it sort of creates those beautiful patterns. Well, if we look back historically, a long time ago, even um, uh, Benjamin Franklin would have phosphine parties. Purkinje would have them. Uh, Alexander Volt would have them. This is a, a, a static electricity machine. People would hold hands uh, at a party and make and break the signal. Um, and I began developing this idea and really was not interested in doing a computer to generate it. And I looked for many, many years for things that might be environmental sources until ultimately I was at a, con a conference at MIT and was just walking down the hall randomly and saw some images that were not data images, but actual analog images of pulsars. Um, and it dawned on me that these would be perfect sources to actually drive sort of the phosphenes. And so the um, source that I used uh, was uh, from the, it's the Crab Nebula from Taurus. And uh, a pulsar is basically a collapsed star that rotates violently in space. And if we're lucky, you get a, a flash of a radio um, uh, energy. And that flash has a periodicity, which means so many times uh, per second. And it also has a signature inside of it. And it mimics exactly the alpha and the beta wave function that's necessary to generate phosphine. So this is a photographic still that's computer generated because this is a work of art that exists in the mind's eye. It can't exist outside of you. Uh, it uses two galvanic electrodes on either side and two on the occiput. And it's about one volt at one milliampere. Uh, people who have migraines like myself, we register it as far more sensitive than anyone else. So the colors are phenomenal. Uh, this is from um, a computer generated model uh, because again, we can't really record uh, the images. This is what it looks like when you're staring 125 million years into space uh, through a radio telescope, uh, looking at this, um, I'll call it 
a billion year creature, right? Um, and in my own practice, I like to think of how I could make work for who we are, but also who we were and who we will become. The last project is Eon, and uh, it uses high energy ultrasound. Um, and it was a Rockefeller Foundation uh, project that uses modulated high frequency ultrasound uh, to create an improbable star in a jar. So if you look to the left, you'll see a tiny little spot of light, a stereo microscope, and two ultrasonic transducers above and below that are at such high amplitude. And they create a force field in the shape of like an hourglass that they actually crush a bubble of oxygen that I release uh, and it's trapped in the center. And then I crush it at almost relativistic speeds. And by doing so, the interface between the air and the water get out of phase. And what uh, comes out of it is a flash of light that physicists have kind of known about for maybe nearly 100 years, but they don't know why. Uh, and the difference for this project is that on the top and on the bottom, again, I'm using a subcarrier that allowed people to send text, and the text converted into spoken word, and the spoken word using the subcarrier actually produce a separate force field so that the light coming out of the star is your uh, spoken voice. The beauty or the interest to me of this little star in the jar is that if you put it through a photospectrometer, that means if we look at the spectra, it's actually a black body. There's no absorption lines. Normally we would have an uh, oxygen and a hydrogen line, either that's the emission line or the absorption line. This is a pure black body. So the light that's coming out of Eon is not from anywhere that we know, except that we're begetting it, right? Uh, outside of sort of our operational awareness, uh, but we're bringing it into the world in which we live in. Um, on Monday, I'll be talking about my new uh, NASA Mars project, which is far newer work than this, but I hope everybody has enjoyed it. And I send my sincere thanks out to all of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And uh, look forward to your uh, being part of uh, uh, the Monday uh, laser. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, invite you, if you like, to uh, briefly participate in uh, uh, the Photonic Futures uh, program if you're available tomorrow. Uh, uh, I will certainly try. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think many of uh, our participants in this uh, eight-day program ought to just be participants in every one of the <laughs> sessions because there's so much uh, crossover, uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, exploration and activity. Uh, it, you know, I, I mean, I've been playing in these worlds as well, and I'm sitting here just uh, overwhelmed and inspired. It's just uh, uh, really lovely. I thank everybody. We're really short of time. And so, there, again, uh, the presentations are so fulfilling uh, of uh, mind and time that we're almost out of time. Uh, no, no time for discussion right now. Uh, I will mention really just briefly before we end this in maybe two minutes, uh, a couple of the other programs for those who are watching uh, as well as participants uh, who may want to uh, tune into those. Um, tomorrow, uh, two lasers, uh, one that I'm uh, really uh, uh, just uh, looking forward to. And in fact, right now I have to go meet this person, uh, Jim Enote. Zuni Farmer, uh, also uh, the chairman of the Colorado Plateau Foundation, as well as the Grand Canyon Trust and many other wilderness society, uh, et cetera. Uh, and he and Dan Collins of ASU are going to be on a session uh, tomorrow uh, dealing with uh, both bioregional and community and indigenous mapping and meaning of place. Uh, and I think that's a really going to be a really interesting program. Uh, Jim Enote will be participating in some other things over the weekend while he's here. Uh, mon uh, also, uh, tomorrow, we have a session, uh, a conversation with two brothers, the, the Menon brothers in New York. One is an artist, one is a physicist, a uh, nanophotonic uh, scientist and uh, and my friend August Muth, a holographer, who uh, I, I think uh, 
uh, I'm personally have long been interested in the the transition from our electronic uh, technological uh, world to the photonic uh, future of uh, information processing along with biogenetic processing. But I think it portends uh, what I think a lot of people aren't aware of, but uh, new forms of logic being applied to our technological applications. And light photons really require a different means of understanding in, in terms of how they process information. That's almost like a new analog. Light is wave and particle. It's not just digital. And digital doesn't uh, uh, just fulfill all of the requirements of that kind of uh, approach to sensing and communication. So uh, photonic futures is going to be real interesting. On Monday, uh, a session with three physicists, an astrophysicist, a biophysicist, and a cosmologist uh, talking about physics, information, and the origin of life. Uh, and I'm especially looking forward to that. Uh, Eric Smith, a physicist I met at Santa Fe Institute, is one of the clearest and concise communicators about difficult science. And I think that's a, a real art form to be able to communicate clearly what are really complex issues uh, and subjects. Um, uh, on uh, Monday, we have a session with Sean again. And... Uh, Quite unrelated and yet uh, complementary, Joshua Garland from ASU, who's dealing with uh, some of the other uh, aspects of our information society, and that is issues of misinformation and disinformation and surveillance and information warfare, and those uh, aspects that are increasingly troubling to us and yet major aspects of our technological and social development. Uh, and, and uh, I think that's going to be real interesting. Um, we have other programs coming up on uh, the sounds and senses of life. Uh, and uh, all of this is on the website. There's a downloadable PDF schedule for those who are interested. Uh, and uh, the Eventbrite site that Andrea Pauly and SciArt Sci Santa Fe are maintaining also is the registration site for these lasers and has the program. Uh, so we have a connection on Wednesday with SIGGRAPH, which is happening concurrently. And uh, that should be really fascinating. We have a session on Wednesday on information economics, but from an ecological economic point of view, rather than our uh, existing capitalist or sorry, our political economic systems. Or let, let's take an earth-based economic uh, uh, let's develop earth-based economic understandings. What is the value of information? Uh, I, I remember going to a Department of Commerce meeting just at the beginning of the Clinton-Gore administration where uh, government, industry, and academics agreed, oh, information is property. <laughs> and we don't have to uh, think any further about patent right changing or copyright or uh, or even who owns information and who rents information. Uh, I think that's going to be a fascinating one. And uh, Artists with Evidence, a group from uh, Alvar Alto Institute in Helsinki, uh, as well as others in New York, are going to be having a discussion with a good friend of mine, Issa Niafaga from Cameroon, who is a political cartoonist who was imprisoned, tortured, released by French human rights group, brought to Paris, became part of the Charlie Edbo group just at the time of their uh, terrorist assassinations. Uh, Issa Niafaga has an interesting story about the nature of information and uh, some of the social aspects. And finally, next Friday, uh, August 2nd, is the Information Commons, an open session for any of our participants to join in on and have an open discussion that we're missing right now. And uh, also included in that open discussion, hopefully, is maybe uh, some discussion of what next. You know, I don't want to just congratulate ourselves on a wonderful program this week, but also sort of think about and even instigate and uh, 
provoke some uh, meaningful next steps in the arts and sciences. Uh, so I thank everybody. See you online. See you in person. See you in the next few days. Thanks all. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Richard.